Hello, Internet, and welcome to Only Lovers Book Club, where I get together with my Bennett sisters in spirit to read a romance novel and talk about it. And this month is the nicest month of our book club's history because this is hangout number 69. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, actually, is it? I'm not sure. I think it is. It's my pick, nonetheless. And I chose for us to do a, a I don't want to say it's a time honored tradition because we don't do it every year, but we do do it on occasion. <laughs> we read a Pride and Prejudice like retelling or remix or inspired by. So like last hangout was inspired by Anastasia, so to speak. And so this one I think is kind of similar to it. We read Sonali Dev's pride and prejudice and other flavors and yeah we're gonna let's get into it just try to read us what pride and prejudice is about and then i'll tell everybody a little bit about sonali dev and then we'll get into the discussion cool okay uh i'm gonna read from the top of the yellow too because i think it's a nice little blurb so <clears throat> Award-winning author Sonali Dev launches a new series about the Rajas, an immigrant Indian family descended from royalty who have built their lives in San Francisco. It is a truth universally acknowledged that only in an overachieving Indian American family can a genius daughter be considered a black sheep. Dr. Trisha Raja is San Francisco's most acclaimed neurosurgeon, but that's not enough for the Rajas, her influential immigrant family who have achieved power by making their own non-negotiable rules never trust an outsider, never do anything to jeopardize your brother's political aspirations, and never, ever defy your family. Trisha is guilty of breaking all three rules, but now she has a chance to redeem herself, so long as she doesn't repeat her old mistakes. Up-and-coming chef DJ Kane has known people like Trisha before, people who judge him by his rough beginnings and who place pedigree above character. He needs the lucrative job the Rajas offer him, but he values his pride too much to indulge Trisha's arrogance. And then he discovers that she's the only surgeon who can save his sister's life. As the two clash, their assumptions crumble like the spun sugar on one of DJ's stunning desserts. But before they can savor the future, they need to reckon with the past. A family trying to build a home in a new land, a man who has never felt at home before, and a choice to be made between the two. That sounds good. I think that's like sort of what I read, but not really. <laughs> it sounds, sounds way more dramatic on there. And somehow the book is even more dramatic, <laughs> honestly. It's but... just dramatic in different ways. Like that makes it seem like there's going to be a lot more like, no say, like, like the family's a part of this book, but not in the way that like mm -hmm. that back cover makes it seem i feel like there's definitely a lot of family tension like there's yeah. there's so many people involved that it's like a lot of it because the family is so powerful like every single thing is so dissected by every member of the family that i could i can't imagine the level of pressure of like i can't make a single decision would be insane okay but let's not talk about that yet <laughs> let me tell you guys a little bit about Sonali Dev. So um, this is from her website, sonalidev.com. And her little sign me up for her newsletter is so cute. It says, let's keep in touch. Sign up for my emails and I'll send you recipes, recommendations, and really bad jokes. And I'm already signed up. So this is all true. And so if you're interested in that, I'll put the link to her newsletter as well. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to read the, she's got a short bio, but I mean, I got time. I'll just read the normal one. <laughs> Sonali Dev's first literary work was about, uh, was a play about mistaken identities performed at her neighborhood Diwali extravaganza in Mumbai. She was eight years old. Despite this early success, Sonali spent the next few decades getting degrees in architecture and writing, migrating across the globe and starting a family while writing for magazines and websites. With the advent of her first gray hair, her mad love for telling stories returned full force, and she now combines it with her insights into Indian culture to conjure up stories that make a mad tangle with her life as a supermom, 
domestic goddess and world traveler. Sonali lives in the Chicago suburbs with her very patient and often amused husband and two teens who demand both patience and humor and the world's most perfect dog. <clears throat> Sonali's novels have been on Library Journal, NPR, Washington Post, and Kirkus's Best Books of the Years list. She has won the American, the American Library Association's Award for Best Romance, the RT uh, Reviewer Choice Award for Best Complimentary Romance, multiple RT Seals of Excellence, is a Rita finalist, and she has been listed uh, for the Dublin Literary Award Shelf, uh, period. Shelf Awareness calls her, quote, not only one of the best, but one of the bravest romance novelists working today, end quote. I like that long one because it kind of really shows just, first of all, it's always really encouraging to me to read authors that have like a whole ass life right before they become authors. Do you know what I mean? Like that's a whole life. <laughs> and it, and it, it encourages and comforts me to know that a lot of the authors that I actually follow uh, and admire are like these later in life authors that they didn't just like come out of college and start writing. They were like, no, I was an architect for a long time. And then I was like, oh shit, I'm getting old. Let me pursue my passion. So um, anyway, I wanted to share that with you guys. I think she's really cool. I could talk to you about why I picked this book. Um, I love a good Pride and Prejudice uh, retelling or inspired by. We have read Pride and Prejudice and zombies, I think it was the very first retelling that we read back in vaginal fantasy days. And I'll like, I'll try to put the cards up. Um, and then we read Pride by E.D. Zoboy, um, which was like the Brooklyn, uh, <laughs> Brooklyn Bronx version of it, I guess, <laughs> young adult. Uh, and I think this one, I can't remember if we read any of the other ones. Um, I know that I've I've watched the uh, Lizzie Bennett Diaries, so it has Drea. I don't know if you're shy. I don't know if you've watched uh, Lizzie Bennett that's Diaries. That's my absolute favorite, and mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. Listen, I love it so much that I bought the actual DVDs, even though the whole thing was free, and I've parted them through every single move, even though I don't even have like a DVD player. But I just I can't let them go. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I get you. I remember I won that contest and I got to interview with like the actress mm -hmm. and the producer. And I was like a lot. That was a lot of fun. Anyway, so that's my favorite so far. Yeah. I mean, technically not part of the book club, but. But I just yes. mean like adaptation in like general. For modern like, adaptation. Yeah. Compare, yeah, that's what I compare every modern adaptation to, because for me, that's been the best one in terms of like making it something new and modern, but like also staying really true to like the original vibes. Yeah, As, I think it works because it is a very like thoughtful, modern adaptation. They're trying to take exactly what's happening in Pride and Prejudice mm -hmm. and bring it into like a very modern, <laughs> a very modern uh, time. Yeah. Frame. So that's, uh, I had read Sonali Dev before, before all of this, which is why I picked um, her her book, her Pride and Prejudice and Other Flavors to read for our episode. Um, I'd read Bollywood Bride. No, I read Bollywood Affair first mm -hmm. and Bollywood Bride. And those books blew me away. Such, it was so good. And it's got a lot of the same things. It's got a lot of like that family drama. It like, it's just very emotionally whiplashing <laughs> um, and hot. It was very, those two, I remember being like, whoa, oh goodness. I had to take a shower uh, after reading <laughs> uh, Bollywood Affair specifically. So, yeah, I, I know she's got it in her. And um, I guess I want to start off by asking you guys, you know, like, how did this meet your expectations? So unlike other books where we might read the back and have an idea of what what it is that we're getting into, um, I think because it, of the title, right, there's a preconceived kind of like expectation of what um, what there is to come. So I kind of want to know uh, how you felt about, once you started reading it, once you got through it, how you felt about it, how you felt about the Pride and Prejudice elements. It, would you say this is an adaptation? Like what were your thoughts as you approached Pride and Prejudice and other flavors? So I am a Pride and Prejudice hoe. Like I love 
everything, everything Pride and Prejudice. I'm like, I think I have a book with like a Jane Austen, a bag, a pillow. Did I forget what words are? I have a pillow with a quote on it uh, behind me that my mom got me. Like she knows I'm a fucking just everything. I mean, a pillow um, is a bag with like stuffing. It's a, I got a pillow bag behind me. <laughs> um, so when you picked this, I was pumped as hell because it's also food. And so that's like my, my two mamma jammas. And so um, I think that she did to, with as far as my expectations, I think she did a good job of meeting them because I didn't want it to be a verbatim retelling because why would I want a verbatim retelling when I have the original? Like, I don't want you to try to recreate the original or beat the original i just want elements from the original that i enjoy to carry through strongly enough in a story so that i have that like that like zest of pride and prejudice and as long as there's some version of mr darcy happening then like i'm sated and so I thought there were like enough elements that carried through in the book where I was like, okay, I see where, where you're pulling forward from like the play on the names, like the, the family dynamic kind of like flipping that around so that she's the one that comes from like a very wealthy family and has all of these like pressures on her. And like, he's the one that's trying to like build himself up and, and like needs these things, like needs, needs to be able to have the job, needs to be able to pull his, like help his sister and pull themselves up out of like this destitute situation that they could end up with. So I thought there was enough there that it scratched the itch without feeling like way too repetitive or, or way too close to, to the original, um, so I thought I thought it was a good like interpretation, at least for what my expectations were. Um, so I think, yeah, I definitely wasn't expecting a super faithful adaptation because I read the, you know, there's like an author's note in the beginning, right? Yeah. So so before I read the book, I read that like author's note and and she says there like that it's more like and it, it was inspired by Pride and Prejudice, but that it's not exactly the same and that there's definitely no like sisters searching for husbands or, you know, like she mentioned a couple of things that she was like, this is not in my book and blah, blah, blah. So going into it, I knew that it was going to be kind of more of a loosely inspired by, you know, like shows are like based on true events, but it's only like vaguely based. Like, <laughs> like that. that's what I was expecting. Um, I think for me, it didn't quite like land the way I wanted it to. And I think that's mostly just because I really didn't like the main character and and that didn't really like change over the book. And so it was kind of hard for me to like root for her or like care about her family too much. Like, I don't know. And, and, and it's not like I think. I know a lot of people like the book and I think it'll be exactly what a lot of people are looking for. Like, I really liked um, I, I liked how like the DJ character was like portrayed. I like like to shy said I like the reversal of the roles and the inclusion of food. And um, there were there were a lot of little things that I liked. Just like overall, not my favorite kind of version of the story. And for me, like I found myself getting a little frustrated sometimes because, um like I knew bad things were coming, if that makes sense. And I was like, when are they going to happen? Like, I was just like waiting for like the shoe to drop. It felt for like a lot of the book because one of the few like recognizable things that was like the same as the original was, um, what's her face, what she called in the book, the, the, the bad chick. Emma. Yeah. Emma. So Emma no, Emma's, is Emma Bingley. the, Emma this is a sister hold on i'll find it bueno anyway the the you know the bing the no no what's his name oh my god let's figure out what the, i don't want to be like, yeah i was i was gonna say like just let's let's i know it's wickham right the, the her last name wickham. but i don't remember her first julie? name julie julia julia is it julia julia, wickham? Yeah. julia wickham. Yeah, yeah it's like i feel like julia right, post it 
I feel like Julia is the character, the one character in the book that's most aligned with like the original version out of all of the characters. So I think she was like a source of constant frustration for me because I knew that she was going to do some shitty things and that she had already done some shitty things. And so every time she came on, I just got like frustrated because I was like waiting. It was like the one predictable thing about the book was that this woman was going to do shitty things. <laughs> and I was like, not here for it and kept getting frustrated at that. But anyway, like I gave it three stars. I, you know, I didn't hate it or anything. Um, but yeah, it just didn't, didn't quite land for me. Um, but that's how it is. You know, it, I'll, I'll, I'll be fair. It, it did beat pride and prejudice and zombies. That is definitely my least favorite <laughs> of, all, of all the adaptations we've read. Um, and so yeah. it did beat that one out. <laughs> just Don't like zombies. I know, I know. Um, so I guess um, you guys read this way smarter than I did because I think um, I read the author's note and yet I was, I was not disappointed, but like just very surprised at I think that when you're working with something like Pride and Prejudice, there have been just so many adaptations, right? Like, not just the ones that we've talked about, like Bridget Jones's Diary, you know, like, yay, both kinds, of, both things, and and so yeah, when the when Pride and Prejudice is in the title of it, whether you whether you're telling me it's not going to stick to the story, I'm already thinking, you know, I'm I'm trying to find exactly what Drea said, like the beats, the story beats that the original is. And um, not to say that I can't drift away from it, but I think it's like a weird kind of like, it's just kind of like a weird test, you know, of like how well the two align, how recognizable the characters, the, the beloved characters are, and the, the kind of like, I guess what I'm, ex what I'm, my expectation was that there was going to be Characters that I, while they, while were imperfect, were likable, and unfortunately, that was not the case in, in this. Um, I had to work also work very hard to like uh, Trisha. I think that we started in this one place with Trisha, and then we end in this. <laughs> I feel like we ended up in the same place, and yeah. I think one of the pivotal things about it is that they both learn not to be assholes but at the end of the story they were both like just fucking assholes that loved each other supposedly and I was like well <laughs> okay cool um and uh, and yeah I so my expectations were I guess thwarted by my own brain I tried to keep them pretty low and just let the story happen as it was and I think that it is fair to say that it is like, it just takes elements from Pride and Prejudice. It's not a straight up adaptation, even though the, it's in the title. One of the things that I really like about the original Pride and Prejudice, and I was kind of interested in seeing how it developed here. I'm just going to segue right into my next question is the family, right? So, you know, the Bennett sisters and just how they interact and, you know, some, some of it's good, some of it's bad. And for the most part, you understand that they love each other, you know, that they really care about each other, that the family, even though mom is crazy, <laughs> even mm -hmm. though mom is absolutely crazy and dad is just like too chill. He's like too chill for everybody. Um, oh man. That's like they, my parents. <laughs> <laughs> that they ultimately love each other. You can tell me till the cows come home that like this family supposedly loved each other, but <laughs> I don't know, man, show me where. Like, what did you guys think about that? Um, how did you react to the hostility between them and just the general lack of understanding. I think for me, um, it took me a little while to figure out the family dynamics because I couldn't figure out if um, the characters were supposed to match like, like the original because like she's best friends with the one sister. So I was like, okay, that's like, like how it is in the original. And then it's like her brother is the one who got like, screwed over by the by the Wickham, you know, so it was like some characters that I could like match. But then in the original, you know, Elizabeth struggles 
like with her mom, but is like really close to her dad. But then in this one, she struggles with everyone because like everyone's a dick. I did think that she did a good job of like establishing these like this like really clear like familial like dynasty sort of is like what what it what it felt like. You know, there was a very clear like leader of the family and we've been doing it this way and we're all gonna rally and do this and like some people are gonna get invited to things and some are not depending on whether I'm pissed at you right now or not and like stuff like that like I found it very believable and I could totally picture like a family like that um I think I was just confused about its like placement in this story like it felt like this family belonged almost like in a different book if that makes sense. So I like enjoyed it, but it like distracted me sometimes from like the rest of the story because some of it just didn't seem to like mesh. Yeah, the, the family was like 50-50. Like I, I was intrigued by it and how it worked, but not necessarily in this book. I think that it's interesting because even though he is the like Darcy character and she is like the sort of Elizabeth character, almost those. So in my, in my opinion, it's like those dynamics completely flipped. So DJ's relationship with his sister is a lot closer and mimics the Darcy relationship between the siblings versus her relationship with her family is this very like structured and like Andrea said, this like dynasty family, which is more closely associated with like the Darcy expectation of like marrying within your caste, marrying within your like rich socioeconomic levels. And so it was hard because when you read Pride and Prejudice, you get it from Elizabeth Bennett's point of view. And this book, you're getting it from Trisha's perspective, but she is the Darcy character, sort of, the, the Mr. Darcy character. So you're not, like, I didn't like her as a character, but Darcy in the first chunk of Pride and Prejudice is not a likable character because you see him as this, like, rich... I mean, I like him. You you also like the loners who no one likes because they're difficult. Like you're 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 the exception to the rule. You don't count. <laughs> and like the group, the census of how people react to his character. Like he he is a, a problematic character, sort of, because he's kind of like a douchebag. Like he's he's just bougie and he like talks shit about Elizabeth Bennett and like makes fun of her not having money like he's a dick she overhears him talking mad shit a lot of the time and so that is what you get with her she's talking mad shit all the time like she is the darcy character but we get things from her perspe perspective so much more that it's like oh man you're a fucking asshole like stop being such a dick it's not that hard to just he's really hot and he's nice like just because he doesn't come from money and so it's this weird thing of like I want to like her because I'm getting so much of her point of view, but like, I wouldn't want to date her and I don't get like that relationship. Mm, I like that he deserves better in my opinion. And so when it comes to like the family dynamics, I'm missing the Bennett household relationship because it's only DJ and his sister. And because she is ill and dying, you don't get a lot of that to kind of offset this like weird super intense like bollywood drama family like intensity and and just like oh my god i'm gonna get cut off blah, 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 that kind of stuff the whole thing makes so much sense to shy but then also i think that's why it was so confusing for me because yeah you're right he's supposed to be the the lizzie but at the same time so much of her family corresponds to those lizzie roles like the stuff with her brother and the Wickham and then her sister with like what's his face that like their love story I took it to be like her sister's love story in the original you know what I mean because they even have that yeah. moment like oh that little tiff this and is the, the and other flavors part where I think that it's all kind of like they take yeah. turns 
Yeah, and definitely. Like, and, and I mean, and Pride and Prejudice, they also take it. turns, but like they, they're like very, like very much so. Yeah, but I think that's the difference is because we've read Pride and Prejudice, and then we're spending mental energy trying mm -hmm. to figure out wait, who's supposed to be who, and whose family is supposed to match. Versus like, if this wasn't at all, then maybe we wouldn't, we would just take it <laughs> and like yeah. face value and not spend so much energy trying to figure out like <laughs> who's supposed to match who. Yeah, exactly. Plus then there's like, there is so much backstory of why people are the way they are that that's another layer you're having to like kind of follow that thread like oh that you're part of this whole rich family everyone seems like glamorous why are you all not getting along oh this thing happened when y'all were young why is that still such a big deal oh he's trying to run for office and like that could become a big scandal okay like cool following along the only one who i think was very true to form was julia wickham because she's a bitch in this book he's a dick in the original every iteration of wickham is always a piece of shit um, but I, you know, I, I, it's a, it's a good read through. It just, it's almost like you do have to check yourself and be like, okay, this is not a uh, word for word. It's not a, a one-to-one -one retelling. Like there is a lot of stuff going on. And so much like a delicious stew, all of the flavors from the original simmer through the story, but in an unexpected way. <laughs> thanks for thanks for mentioning that. I, I think that what you're saying, what you're both saying, makes a lot of sense. I think that they have definitely switched class positions, and that changes a lot for even our expectations of Trisha as like this like professional woman, uh, you know, like who will not be like cowed by anyone, and like has her standards and doesn't want to really, you know, give up her, you know, social standing, you know, to cave to this poor chef what is it you know so i think that without that loving family because even I mean, darcy loved his sister like what the fuck like don't tell me that they were assholes she wasn't like the perfect person but he literally like just left like even for bingley who is not his family he was like yeah she fucking sucks let's go and then they like fucking leave town like you know what i mean he definitely there's love there it's i guess that's what i'm saying that without that loving family to balance out Trisha's like more like prickly things, it was very hard to find a good like mental, <laughs> good mental like, hold on like, I feel, I should feel good about this. I feel, I feel good about this, right? Should I feel good about this? And, so. and I will say I read a, a recipe for persuasion recently mm -hmm. and you get so much more of like a nice loving family interaction in that book between the Rajas and even though there's like a shit ton of drama and like really bad stuff happens to some of the characters in that book there's also that unseen support system that you don't get in Pride and Prejudice and other flavors like you don't see a support system here whereas in the other one it's like oh yeah like family cares for family and and that i think that story happens way after this like like nisha uh trisha and dj have already been together for a while like in that book and i think the resolution of certain things in this book then opens the door for that dynamic to exist in recipe for persuasion because you do then get the like cousins making fun of each other and like teasing and like the inside jokes and like ha ha you're annoying but like we love you like that energy then exists within the relationships so this is like why don't y'all like each other <laughs> yeah this is like why don't you like each other and then after like this end chunk happens where like everything is kind of pseudo solved then in the next book everyone's like yeah, much so much closer to the dynamic you expect to be getting so let's talk about let's talk about our love interests. Sis? I think the only love interest here is DJ Kane. I'm not gonna lie. What did you guys think about their their dynamic? Um, did you ship them? Right, that's like the big question. Did you ship them? Was there enough room to ship? Did this book give us enough space to ship? Uh, I have my answers, but I want to hear yours first. I didn't ship them because I didn't think Trisha did enough to earn 
being in a relationship with DJ because he was by no means perfect, but his whole deal was like, I'm trying to work and I'm trying to save money so that I can like get my sister surgery. Like I want my sister to live. I've had a lot of trauma. My family has passed away. Like I'm by myself. I've had to hustle. Not only am I dealing with like immigrating and like all that stuff, but there's also racism because not only like, am I, uh, mixed but i'm you know dark skinned i'm perceived as a black man i struggle with this and also don't have my family support system my one family member i have left is dying so like uh, i felt a lot of uh sympathy for his character and then also he's a fucking show so like hell yeah like feed me daddy but with her she's just like i'm a genius i'm so smart everyone needs to listen to me i'm always right blah 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 and I, she never stopped being annoying and and it it was like her redeeming quality for him is like that she appreciated food and she was always hungry, but she's only always hungry because she never eats because her schedule is busy. So I'm like, "Mm." let me go with that. Like, I, I feel like he should have dated a different Raja's sister because there's, there's probably other people in the family who were like more deserving of him. Okay. I also, um, didn't really ship them. Um, mostly because of her. (laughs) Um, I don't know that I would have shipped her with anyone. And I get that they're trying to make her into the Darcy or whatever, but like just something about it just didn't work for me. So I feel like if she had been a true Darcy, I would have not only shipped it, but I would have wanted to date her. So that's indicative of the fact that she was not a true Darcy in my opinion. Um, But I also didn't like him. I also would not have dated him. DJ on paper, I would have dated. But DJ in this book, I would have not because he also annoyed me just like Trisha did. But like on paper, yes, he said, but she sounds great on paper too. Like sexy, like woman doctor who's like a neurosurgeon. It's like my dreamy and like girl version, like, Yes. I, so I don't know. I don't know what happened. Like on paper, I would have dated either of these people on paper. I should have liked them and I should have shipped them. But it just in this particular story, like, yes, I like chefs on paper. It's just something, something about DJ. And you know what? It could literally just be his name. I hate that his name is DJ. I hate that as a name. I couldn't seriously call someone like, Oh, I see DJ. Oh, I see harder. No, nobody would say that. You wanna go <laughs> are you gonna be sexy with someone in bed whose name is DJ? I see DJ harder. Love it. That's what I'm saying, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Okay. Yeah, I'm shook. I'm shook. <laughs> they needed more more room. Like yeah, so definitely. much is happening here that mm-hmm. they didn't get a chance to like go on dates that's what i'm saying so that's why that's what i'm saying i'm thinking i think that the reason the romance didn't work for me and it might not have worked for you guys was because the romance wasn't really given a lot of space so i have this entire family saga in each chapter that i have to get through right and i'll be honest i'm like i don't care like i i'm not here i'm again i'm reading pride and prejudice prejudice and other flavors so what am i expecting i'm expecting lizzie and darcy and there's cooking and frankly, there's not enough food in this. I mean, the what food there is, is like, it sounds great, but there's way more stuff about the Rajas that I cared for. It didn't feel like a very even book. It didn't set my expectations for the book that I got presented to. I didn't expect like an entire family saga of like drama and like terrible people. That being said, so then in the small pockets, that we get um, Trisha and DJ hanging out. They're not nice to each other. They're like not nice. And the whole thing, right? If we're saying that Trisha is the Darcy here, that she's the rich, entitled, arrogant bitch uh, that she's supposed to be. I'm not saying that she definitely had to soften herself as a woman to do that. But the whole thing about Darcy is that he does like this big ass gesture to show, hey, I do have all of this money and I don't care to part with it in order to help you and your family. I don't care about social shit anymore. I don't care about my standing in society. I want to help you out because I love you. And I definitely did not get that from Trisha. She wanted to help 
Emma because that's her job and her professional pride is on the line. And, you know, she doesn't want her to be blind so she can keep drawing pussies and dicks on her art, you know? Correct me if I'm wrong. Like, her big gesture is is supposed to be that scene where she's like, oh, I'm attracted to you, right? Not good like, enough. That's <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying, yeah, I agree. But, like, right, there's nothing after that. That's, like, the big scene. And then... I thought the big gesture was, like, her taking the girl taking the sister to talk to the lady so that she would decide to get the surgery because even though she's going to lose her sight she can still make art and then also like not agreeing like using their their connections to basically be like if you put out this video of this girl like we're going to sue you and and fucking take you down yeah, I think the difference here is that um, a lot of her gestures are tied up in her job. Yeah. So for me, it doesn't feel it's like it doesn't like, feel like a big I, sacrifice. I get, it. I get it that she does this whole thing where it's like, I don't care what you say, father. I'm gonna operate on like Emma, anyways, or whatever. But like, I feel like she would have done that for anyone just because of you know what I mean. Like she's like that kind of doctor. So like. I think for me, some of those gestures maybe like when you say them to shy, they make sense like, oh, yeah, yeah, this kind of matches. But I think because so much of it is involved or like twisted up in her role as a doctor, I guess I'm not sure how much of that she wouldn't have just done for any other patient. I feel like the the big thing is that she does decide to do it regardless of the family, the dad saying no, because she she does finally try to like mend this this like create this bridge after they had fallen out and it's almost like this is the thing you can do to to be back to normal with the family and she's like i'm not doing that just i guess for me i just wasn't convinced that it was like because of her love for dj and not because of her love for her profession i agree i, I think don't... it's it's more like a commentary on her like ethics than it is because Darcy did it for Elizabeth mm -hmm. here Tr Trisha did it because of her ethics yeah and being like I'm a good doctor why would I not why would I not save her if I can like yeah. fuck you. that was never that was never in question so there was never a question in my mind that Trisha was going to help Emma and so when she helps her I'm just like cool okay and like <laughs> Here's your giant paycheck for saving her life. Uh, yeah, great. Let me build my insurance. Make sure to build my insurance for that or whatever. Oh, wait, they don't because he's like four. All, all this to say, all of this to say that I don't think that considering how much of his own personal sacrifices we get to see, how much we see um, DJ kind of like endure on his own because of his background and with his sister and, you know, being fucking microaggression to death by Trisha, for fuck's sake. Um, I just don't think that, you know, she... I don't think that we were given the opportunity to like her more because of that. Again, I think that, yeah, her professional ethics were on the line. She was never not going to help Emma. And so, to me, yeah, she doesn't, like, win the romance award. I don't understand why DJ what he sees in her aside from her being like really attractive and like really passionate and someone to like look up to like i would still think she was a cool person but what i want to put my dick in her no not really i i didn't i didn't ship them i definitely thought he could do better i i was literally like as i'm reading it i'm like ugh. so shy would have treated him better or andrea would have absolutely <laughs> eaten this like if he made it you know what i mean i, I because i treat all staff <laughs> for any place with the utmost re utmost respect Everyone should be treated with respect. As soon as I bumped into him in the kitchen, I would be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry to be back here. I don't want to be in the way. I didn't have a chance to eat. Everything looks amazing. Thank you so much. I'd have been so respectful. And then he would have been like, oh my God, like try this thing that I made. And then I would have lost my shit, dropped my panties immediately. Then been like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Let me pick my panties back up. This is not hygienic in the kitchen. Here's my business card. Uh, text me. Like, as much as I didn't like Trisha's character, though, I wanted her to, like, exist in real life. Like, I kept thinking of that book we read with all the really sexy lesbian doctors. Like, yeah. and, I, and I was just, like, picturing, like, oh, my, like, like, 
Yeah. Like if Trisha really were like a thing, like I would absolutely be one of those people who's like, holy shit, that's my doctor. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like how was Emma? Like Emma is going around like drawing vaginas all the time. And Mama has to guess she wasn't drooling over her doctor. Just she might have been on the DL. As soon as she finds out her and DJ are dating, she's like, <laughs> guess I can't masturbate about her anymore. I mean, she can. <laughs> You know, she would. One of the things that I definitely wanted to talk to you guys about, um, it doesn't necessarily have to do with the romance, because I think we're all on the same page. Um, despite us, like, really liking this, there was just some things that didn't, like, didn't hit just right. The romance, which is what I'm reading it for, was the one that didn't work out the most. But um, there was another aspect of this book that I wanted to talk about, and that was, I guess, how uh, disabilities... Uh, <laughs> were uh, commented on. So not every book is supposed to be like this perfect world and not every character, especially a doctor character, um, is supposed to be like, okay, I guess you just live like this now. Um, but I did find it a little bit personally, I did find it a, a little bit disconcerting of just how often the blindness itself felt like a death sentence and then the I remember the wheelchair being a big deal too mm -hmm. and about how like you know it obviously is like a life adjustment if you are kind of like coming into that later on in your life but the way that the way that they kind of like talked about losing your sight not being able to walk or not being like a fully able-bodied person made me very unhappy, <laughs> especially because I understand where Emma's coming from when it comes to like, if I can't see, then I don't want to live because art is my life. But you're really going to tell me that this person who's drawing pussies and cocks, like can't pick up like clay and make pussies and cocks out of clay after losing their sight. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's one of those things where I felt like we didn't get enough of like the alternative of like, hey, this is actually not so bad. Hey, like you can still live a full life this way. Um, but because the people that we're like interacting with have like, for example, Trisha is not only a doctor who believes that, you know, she wants to give like Emma the best ever, but is also like, oh, I need her to be able to see this is a fucking personal failure for me and she won't be able to see and her life is over. And then their whole shame about like the guy being in the wheelchair. I don't know, maybe it was a me thing. And I'm not saying that Sonali Dev is saying something about disabled people, but I think the language and the events in the story could have been kinder to less able people. I don't know if you guys feel like uh, I, I, I felt the same way, um, especially I can understand the way that they talk about the wheelchair and stuff because we're only getting the perspective of this family who's clearly very focused on like there is a correct way to do things and a correct way to live and everyone must be like to their full potential so i got that that might have been like the only perspective we see on that but i was very surprised by trisha's um like approach to the whole blindness thing as a doctor um, because I feel like in real life, if if someone's looking at, you know, becoming blind or deaf or something like that, the first thing your doctor is going to do is say, like, here is this place that you can go to to get training on how to navigate life as a blind person. And here is like a mental health professional who's going to talk to you about this. And here is like, you know, I feel like the, it, it, she would have been presented with all of these options on like how to transition into this sort of life um and none of that was like presented here it was more like why not what you're gonna be blind now like sucks for you and then of course like emma you know reacts passionately in the way that she does where i feel like if it had been approached different approached differently um by her doctors um it might not have seemed uh, yeah, it's like what, like what you put in the chat, Chris. It might not have seen as like all or nothing, like um, because it seemed like Emma didn't know very much about blindness or blind people. Um, and as a doctor, right, like her doctor should know more. Um, and I know like I've personally been like learning a lot about it recently. Well, I had a blind student last year, so that like helped a lot in my interactions but also this year I read a memoir about a deaf blind person 
and there's like de there's like blind training centers all over the US where you can just like go and stay for free for like months and they teach you like how to use a cane and how to like learn how to cook and 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 do pottery and like blacksmithing and like anything you could want to learn like it they're like really cool but they're meant for that for like people who were not born blind and are now becoming blind and I feel like that's something that like doctors are probably <laughs> aware of and in real life would like share with their patients. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was a little jarring that this was just presented as like, you're just going to go blind and we're not going to give you any resources <laughs> to like help you cope with that. But then again, I feel like if that had been the case in the book, there wouldn't have been like that this whole plot <laughs> because Emma seems like a very like um smart and like I feel like if Emma had been presented with all these options then she wouldn't have been like but no I'm gonna die <laughs> she would have been like oh well okay so maybe there's other ways which is how she reacts when she's presented with this like art place right like it doesn't take a long time she's like oh I hadn't thought about this as like a possibility like this is actually really cool like it didn't take long at all for her to get like on board um, and so I think it really was kind of like a plot device. It's like, we're going to leave this until the end. It's going to be a romantic gesture. This is so that so that we can say Trisha is the one who changed Emma's mind and not anybody else. Um, but I don't know that that part just didn't seem like realistic to me. And, and like Chris said, I, I do think it came across as a little ableist and a little like. I don't know. Like, like, wow, this is like the most terrible thing <laughs> that can happen to an artist when actually there are a lot of artists that are disabled and they're still making um, really good art and really productive art and kind of pursuing their careers, um, you know, maybe in different ways than they did before, but they're still pursuing their careers. So, yeah, I do think, but I don't think it's something a lot of people think about. Like, I don't think she did it intentionally. I guess... So I, I understand both of your perspectives on this. I agree that treating it as if, you know, losing her sight is like the equivalent of dying. So like might as well die um, was not great. Um, but I think having Trisha be so focused on being able to retain her sight where she doesn't necessarily even consider this other possibility of helping Emma transition into a, a, a sightless, you know, uh, life. I, I think it says more about her character and about her inability to understand other people's experiences like that. Like she, she, is presented as someone who lacks almost like the ability to put herself in other people's shoes. And because she is this super genius, like everyone has this expectation of perfection from her. I don't think she can necessarily fully empathize with other people's experiences. And so for her, everything is either win or it's lose. There is no middle ground. There is no, I can be the second best surgeon. I can be the, I can get the second best thing because of the expectation that the family has put on all the kids. And so I think it takes the book for her to kind of understand that it is not possible to exist in always being in this perfection. And that's when she's able to kind of remember that these other alternatives exist and like explaining that to Emma in a way that isn't like, well, because I think another big issue too is Emma is such a, a like her art defines her as a person. Like that's what she clung to after her family died. And it's almost like this is her only identity. She does not have anything after this. And if she loses this, 
then she has lost everything because she already lost her family and doesn't have a home and all this shit's already happened. And so this is what she gained control of. This is how she's been able to like build her space in this world. And if that goes away, then what the fuck else does she have? And again, explaining it as like an evolution of her artistic expression versus the loss of her artistic expression and a second best option is what ends up making her decide to get the surgery. It's not, oh, you're going to lose your ability to be an artist, but like you'll still be alive. It's, hey, your art can change. Art changes over time. Your life is changing into this direction, but your art can also change in that way. And you can touch people in a different way. That perspective is what is able to help her make this decision. But she can't get there until Trisha can get there. And Trisha can't get there until she's able to understand that, like, you, it's impossible to be perfect all the time. Is it, is it presented in, in the way that I'm explaining it now? Not 100%. Not Hell really. no. I wish it had. I really <laughs> I really wish that it had, and I think that that would have been, <clears throat> sorry, that would have been a more redemptive arc for Trisha's assholery than than what it happens just, in the book. Yeah, there's just like it, it, it's treated in a way that's like a bit reductive because so much energy is provide is it so much space is given to like the family dynamic. If the family dynamic had been pulled away a bit and given less space in the book, then you could have had a much deeper and more nuanced understanding of Trisha's perspective of how this family dynamic has like traumatized even the way that she approaches people and her inability to empathize with people. Like she thinks she's a great doctor because of her technical skills, but she doesn't have the bedside manner. She doesn't have the ability to kind of understand the full journey of this, this person who she's treating and thus the people who she treats Emma specifically is like you don't give a shit about me you don't give a shit about what my life is going to be like you only give a shit about getting this surgery checked off and it's true she doesn't care about the real impact the loss of sight is going to have on Emma and until that clicks in the book and that becomes like the gesture that's the only time when a Emma's able to like be receptive to this next step in her life. And so it's like, I wish those conversations had been deeper and there had been a, a better breakdown of how, oh, um, I wish there had been a better breakdown of that because I can draw my conclusions. I can try to understand the reasoning behind it, but not everyone is gonna give it the the benefit of the doubt and i like the book enough and i like sonali dev enough that i'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt and i'm gonna read it in a way where like my point of view is is adding shades to to what is written and what's happening but not everyone's gonna have to gonna do that and not everyone has to do that like you don't have to give anyone the benefit of the doubt at, on anything you know it whatever floats your boat um so yeah i think it could have been treated in a different way but i think the three of us are very empathetic people we do strive to care about other people a lot and trisha as a character does not do that and emma as a character is not getting that from trisha and so it's like if i don't think that i'm going to be able to exist and and be the version of myself that I've worked so hard to build after the surgery happens, then like, why, why would I, why would I, e you know, even bother? So uh, that's my very lengthy take on that <laughs> question. Oh, but it was an excellent one. I wish that, I'm not saying that it was like a terrible book because it's not kind to blind people, but I do wish that that had been more of a focus of the story um, rather than everything else that we got. This is by no means an exhaustive discussion on all the things that we could talk about from this book. These are just the things that I wanted to discuss um, because I was like, I'm confused or I'm stupid. Let me know how you feel about it. <laughs> I don't understand my feelings. Walk me through it, you know? <laughs>
that seems to be uh, a wrap up of Pride and Prejudice and other flavors. Uh, not a perfect adaptation by any means, but an interesting book and one uh, worthy of discussing. If you've made it this far into our episode, thanks for sticking around. Um, and we'll catch you in the next one. <laughs> lovely, lovely yeah. out. Just lovely exit. Uh, until then, bye-bye. bye bye. Bye. Yeah, he's not. He's not trying to eat it. He's too tired. He is too tired. That's what it is. Thank you for hanging out with us. You can support Only Lovers Book Club by dropping some change in our tip jar and buying some books with our bookshop link. You can find us on Instagram at Only Lovers Book Club, and from there, find our individual accounts and projects. Feel free to favorite or rate us if that's an option for you, but always make sure to like and subscribe and turn on your notifications so you never miss an episode.